So Ricky, tell us why uh, tell us why Anthony Joshua triggered your start to the journey and why you're probably still in the four years I've been running RNT the most ripped client that's arrived in uh, arrived to, to us at the beginning. Tell us the story behind this. So we've got to go back probably about five years, and um, I'd just been working for a multinational who had me traveling around the world. I used to work in foods. Uh, probably we'll talk about that a bit later on. And a lot of my time was spent going out to restaurants, eating a lot of dinners, you know, on the premise of doing market research, you know, actually you're just going out socializing. But the point is over the course of that sort of three years, I put on a lot of weight, right? I was 80 kilos at, at my heaviest and I'm five foot six tall. So that was 80 kilos of not muscle. Um, and uh, it got to a point where I made basically a decision to say, right, I need to do something different. The travel was affecting my home life, got two kids, wasn't seeing my boys conscious that my activity levels were sort of dropping off, conscious that really I was spending all my time on Zoom calls or out uh, with work and not really paying my family, my time at home, my friends, the attention that it needed to. So I joined another company of which Anthony Joshua is one of the brand ambassadors. And in probably my first week or so, actually I had the chance to meet him. And he said to me, all right, big boy, and here's me thinking, I thought in that moment, I thought, okay, well, no, you're taking the mick out my height, aren't you? And we had a picture and he's sort of like, you know, doing this kind of thing. His fist is the size of my head. And, uh, and I took a look at that picture and I was like, yeah, you weren't talking about my height, mate. <laughs> um, you know, there, there was something in that, in that, in, in that small comments, which made me think, right, okay, I've got to do something. At the same time, uh, the company that I was with actually put me on a really interesting training, which was sort of going into what makes you resilient and what are the factors which start to drive that. And it comes down to kind of like, you know, do you have the right support network in place? Do you have purpose and passion in your work? Um, and uh, are you taking care of yourself? Do you prioritize self-care? And, you know, the first two things, you know, tick, tick the box, extremely passionate about what I do. Uh, I've got a great support network in place. But was I prioritizing self-care? No, I definitely was not doing that. And I think those two things then basically just sort of came together. And I thought, right, well, something, something has got to change here, right? I've got, I've got myself now the freedom, the space to, to do something. Let's actually see, let's actually give this a crack and let's see how far I can, I can actually go. I've lost weight in the past, right? So, uh, you know, I've had sort of ups and downs. Uh, I've uh, run... I've been an endurance racer in the past. Uh, I've, I've done a 10K in 45 minutes, which I thought was fairly good. Um, so dieting and losing weight, I think is, 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 I describe it as simple, not easy, right? And actually you guys put out really good content around the best ways to, to lose weight. Um, you know, make sure that you're in a calorie deficit, make sure your activity is up. Um, and I think if you can sustain that, then the weight will, the weight will come off. And uh, I was a bit stubborn, actually, I think. So the reason why I came to you as, you know, quote, unquote, the most ripped client is, is because I thought, I'm going to pay a cash to tell me to eat less food. <laughs> you know? um, I can, that's something which um, uh, I, I think I could probably give a solid crack at. But what I don't know how to do is I don't know how to um, progress from that, right? So um, I look at those pictures of myself um, and I think to myself, yeah, I've lost all the body fat, but there's nothing else there. You know, um, I'm, I'm skin and bones. And what's the way? I don't know how to build muscle in the most effective way. I don't know how to grow a physique. I don't know how to get stronger. Um, I can run, ride a bike, but can I pull three times body weight off the floor? No, help me. And I think that's really where I saw the value in learning a technical skill, um, in learning um, how to grow muscle, in getting proficient in all of that is really, you know, kind of the, the thing which I came to you guys for. And I think I've managed to take home in spades. Thank you, Mr. Pilkington. Have you, um, when, when you, when you explored weight loss in the past, did you, did you rebound a lot? Did you, did you suffer through ups and downs with your weight? Or did you have periods where you were in good, decent shape and periods where, you know, you'd let go of yourself? How did that play out? Yeah. So I think it really depended on my, my life stage, right? So um, before I had kids, I actually found it pretty easy to stay in, in shape. So um, granted, that wasn't through intuitive eating or anything like that. I was tracking on my fitness pal, 
uh, I was measuring stuff out and I had to make a real concerted effort to, to do that. And the thing is, the second I sort of, um, I let go, you know, I sort of, you know, I, I finished that race or I hit that, whatever that milestone was, then bound over the next three to six months or whatever it might be. Since having kids and since my career kicked up a gear as well, it meant that I didn't have the time to focus on that or like, why well, I now realize it's an excuse. Of course, you can make the time to do that. But um, at the time, I felt like I didn't have the time to do that. I was trying to juggle all the different things. And that's really where the yo-yoing started to, to happen. Mm. What have you found? Because you came to us at the start of 2020 and you've, you've, you know, you've maintained control. You've not had these sort of like, oh, I want to get in shape for a photo shoot. I want to run a 10K in 45 minutes, these sorts of goals. You've, you've almost just enjoyed the, the progressive nature. How have you embodied that mindset compared to before? Like what's, what triggered you to say, okay, I'm actually just going to learn and focus on performance because I know you're very performance oriented and you, know, you talk about the better you perform in the gym, the better you perform at work. How, why, is, why is investing in this area so important to you? And why have you managed, how have you managed to change that, your thinking around how you approach it? I mean, I still have goals, um, yeah. but they're a combination of long and short-term goals, right? So um, next year I'm 40, and I joined you guys when I was 38. So I said to myself, if I can't do it now, then I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Like, it's not going to happen for me. So um, that, that longer-term milestone birthday is at the, is at the edge of my mind thinking, right, that's at a point where I want to make sure that I've got a physique that perhaps I didn't do in the, in the past. And then the love of training and, and, and understanding it, it does come from going for those mini kind of quarterly, half yearly goals, seeing what other amazing athletes have done and thinking, can I even get half of this? If I can do that, then that's brilliant. And just going, just turning up and showing and trying all the different things you know, adjusting a hand position there, seeing if I can get a bit more leverage on a deadlift here, you know, all of that kind of test and learn and experimentation is just, it just really sort of motivates me. The link to performance at work is something a little bit different though, right? So I think I'm in situations at work where I'm often faced with very sort of tough conversations, um, trying to convince people to do stuff that they perhaps don't want to do um, or hearing news that they don't want to, to hear in terms of, um, people with their pet projects and, and, and what have you. And what I find is that, um, or what I found is that, you know, potentially in the past, I felt, um, I don't want to say in, insecure, but it's certainly not been easy for me to face into those kinds of conversations. You almost get that adrenaline rush, that fight or flight kind of syndrome. Nowadays, what I find is that if I've started the day with a solid workout and I pick something heavy up off the floor, you know, it's pretty easy to go into those conversations knowing that you've actually done something significantly harder already. And mentally, you just feel so much stronger for having for having done that. And that, I think, is something which I've only discovered through this through this process. Um, and specifically, the timing of my workouts and making sure that I start the day with, with my workouts. I, I find that I perhaps don't get that same benefit if I do it later on in the day. It's got to be that precursor to the rest of the things that follow. So, do you wake up and, and train straight away? I mean, pretty much. I have a cup of coffee. <laughs> and then I'm in the gym and you train at home right right yeah yeah and that was quite deliberate um I mean a because the the gyms near me are uh, you know not not amazing the the newest gym to me has one squat rack and two barbells and that's pretty much it it's not, not great um but also I was quite determined that when I go through this and, you know, when I'm doing all of this kind of stuff, I wanted to make sure that it didn't impact on my home life, my family life. You know, I've got, I want to make sure that by taking two hours out of my day to go train and go to the gym, that wasn't meaning that uh, I wasn't at home to help uh, get the kids ready in the morning or whatever, whatever it might be. And having that space at home eliminates a chunk of time. It makes it very easy for me. Um, at work, we have these concepts of what I call physical and mental availability. And mental availability is, uh, brands use that to basically think, uh, to, to, to drive that salience of what they stand for and the recall of what they're doing, right? And the second is physical availability. You won't do something unless it's physically available to you. I applied those principles to my training. So the fact that I have a gym at home and the fact that I've done that means that I can't forget to go to the gym because it's there. It's really easy for me to do that. Physical availability, I don't have to make excuses that 
Oh, the squat rack was not free. Uh, the equipment was not there. I didn't have a chance. I didn't go past the gym or it was, I was running home late from work and therefore I couldn't do it. It's there. And so those barriers are eliminated from that whole kind of process. So those, those two things were really important to me when I set out uh, to, to go for the sort of training at home piece. I didn't realize how far it would get. I literally bought a barbell, um, a Reebok deck, and um, I thought, okay, well, let's, let's do that, right? There's a lot you can do with that. You know, now I, I just literally bought a cable machine. Um, really? <laughs> so there's a cable you, machine. Then you got there. Alico plates, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, it's a sickness, I'm telling you. Um, you know, but, the, there's good things. There's the worst things you can shop for. There's no difference between them and any other, you know, weight is weight. But um, as a brand marketer, as somebody who's interested in brands, you know, there's just something about what they stand for. There's something about the product experience. They're just beautiful things to, to hold. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, if my wife's music the cost of those, so I, I probably would just get much more than the house. <laughs> what's been your favorite piece of equipment you bought at home? And what's been, actually, a good question would be, what, uh, that one too, but ask, answer, what would you recommend others to have if they're investing in a home gym? And this is, this is um, you're someone that's had a home gym pre-COVID, so this is not just a lockdown reaction. Am I right? Or- right. Right. Yeah. It, it's not, it was, um, COVID was a coincidence. So I invested yeah. in a lot of stuff before, before then. Um, I think you can do a lot with the basics of, you know, a bar and a rack. If you've got a bar and a rack and a bench, you know, you've got 80, 90% of your bases covered. Um, and actually Ed's been really creative in actually showing me ways in which I can use that equipment that I hadn't even thought of. So for example, you know, setting up for a chest supportive row off the pins, I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, my favorite piece of equipment, which I haven't bought yet, um, it's on my it's on my to buy list, is 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 a trap bar, uh, specifically a half trap bar because a they look pretty stunning, and b the flexibility that they can provide um, is is pretty cool. So those are the things which are in my mind. But I think to train at home, you don't need you don't need a lot. A dun- you know, a dumbbells, a bar. And you can do a lot. And uh, if you've got the space for it, um, a, a rack or a pair of squat stands just opens up a whole world of uh, exercises for you. One thing I love about um, some stuff you mentioned is, is the insatiable appetite to learn about your body. Is You're not just settled on, I want to eat a little bit less calories or I need to eat more food. You want to know the hand positions, the bars, the exercises, the intricate details. What Where does this love for, for learning come from, especially in this realm of of health and fitness where when did you decide like i'm actually you, you know you're obsessed with learning more about these sorts of things my job is really about testing and learning so in order to succeed in my role at work in order to create great innovations for consumers for brands i need to experiment i need to try small changes i need to really deal with the one percent differences to get to that thing and it's only by testing and learning those things do you get to that and it's something which is I've really discovered through this as well. I actually, if I apply the principles of my professional life into my personal life, they somehow have a parallel. Who'd have thought? So um, it, it, I just find it so fascinating that your body can react so differently to something as small as you know to change in arm position, and you can get that extra two percent of performance in, in doing that. You know, I mean, ideally, at one point, I'd like I would like to uh, compete in some kind of powerlifting type of event because I have interest in this kind of strength and technique forms such a big part of that in order to move the most uh, in order to move the most weight so there's a goal attached to it in terms of why i'm interested in it but there is just a love for learning for the sake of learning because ultimately you just get that extra bit of performance which is going to help you in your journey just by just by doing it based on your professional world um, that love learning for just for the sake of learning what we've seen in commonalities of people who embody that characteristic who are open to uh, taking risks and accepting failure. Um, failure is a learning at the end of the day. It's not actually a disaster if you don't succeed in something. It's only an opportunity to learn as to why that didn't work and how you can do differently next time. Um, not everything you do will work, you know? Uh, so right now it's got me trying to uh, squat with the uh, heels elevated. And that's just not working out for me, but that's okay. You know, I've tried it. It's something which I've learned from. Um, and, uh, you know, there's probably a way I can make it work, or if it doesn't work, right, I stop doing it. But I don't regard the fact that I've tried it and not succeeded as a failure in, in and of its own right. And I think that's probably a really important trait for somebody who values learning for the sake of learning. Um, it's okay to fail. 
with the with learning and test trial and error you know there's there's the training element there's also the nutritional element where yes it's it's one thing to lose weight it's another thing to make it a sustainable lifestyle and to, to, to keep it all off and to when you're adding weight to do it in a controllable fashion how's that trial and error experience been for nutrition whereby you've integrated something into your lifestyle so if you can eat around the table with your family they don't think dad's weird <laughs> doing something different it, it it's very it becomes very normal how how's that that experience been and where how yeah. did the transition look over the years or well, year think, and a half i think it it's there's been a whole bunch of different things um so i think probably the first thing is just understanding which of the behaviors that i had were the ones which were triggering weight gain right so it wasn't always the meals which i was having with my family it was what i was doing in between the meals uh, and, you know, potentially knocking some of that on the head. And I think that's where probably Ed's been really helpful in starting me to help me to understand which some of those slightly more destructive behaviours were. So, for example, picking at the kids' food whilst you're making it, right? It might seem like a small thing, but it's unnecessary. What am I getting out of it? Um, it's just, it's habit more than anything else. Um, so, first of all, understanding those behaviours and just eliminating them. But the second is actually recognising that a lot of the work that I do with consumers and understanding their behaviors with foods apply to myself right i try i try and you know not think of myself um as the people that i spend my time talking to but actually all of the same things apply to me so whilst i might dream of making paella with you know all of this kind of beautiful stuff i don't do that very often even though it might be one of my favorite foods it's not part of my meal repertoire and when you understand that actually most people have a meal repertoire for dinners, let's say, of probably between seven and 10 meals, it becomes really easy, right? Because you can figure out what those 10 meals look like, what the macro profile is, and it's done, you know? And as long as you, it requires a bit of a mental about face to accept the fact that, yeah, no, I, I really do only have a repertoire of 10 meals. And to be okay with that, um, most people don't even realize that that's actually the truth, but it's genuinely the truth. And most of those meals are quite boring as well. Um, and people think that they crave variety and interest, but what most people eat day to day is pretty boring. Yeah, I think there's some research around that, how many foods actually people actually eat. And it's very minimal, isn't it, when you consider it? So when you, when you say to people, I think you should try and stick to something to build in a habit, they're suddenly like, oh, no, I need loads of variety. This is too restrictive. And the all that chat. Meal, yeah, yeah. The most popular meal in the UK is um, toast meals. Right, so toast. Toast, cheese and toast, beans, and toast, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, if you think about it, right, most people have the same breakfast day in day out, and they don't think about it. You know, people don't complain that they had to have toast for breakfast. It's only when you say no, you can't have toast for breakfast, and go, ah, oh, what do you mean? You know, like uh, I, I, I need, sorry, when when you say, oh, you must have toast for breakfast, and think, oh, what, what do you mean? I must have toast, even though they've been eating it every day for the last five years. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, it's the same with oats, right? Like, uh, you probably can eat porridge quite happily every single day. But you tell me, clean the palate, Ricky, you're going to eat oats every single day for the next two weeks. It's that narrative you tell yourself, you're restricting me. You, I, I'd like to imagine that I could have all of these decadent breakfasts and all of that variety, when the reality is I probably wouldn't have had it. Anyway. What's, the, what's the psychology behind that? Why, why, why do humans behave in that way? Yeah, there's a, there's a few different things. So... Um, First of all, it's people have a whole bunch of inherent biases into the way in which they, into the way in which they think. Um, so uh, the first is confirmation bias, right? So it's this idea that you seek to validate your presupposed opinion of something by looking for data and evidence. So um, if you tell me that, right, you can only have oats for breakfast for the next two weeks, um, I'm going to be looking for reasons why I, I think that that's a really bad idea or that's a really dull thing because you're restricting me. Um, and so it's an inherent bias that we have as, as human beings. The second is, is um, uh, what we call, I guess, anchoring bias, or it's, it's the fact that pre-existing information biases our response to how we see a particular situation. So if I've had oats before in the past um, and I perhaps didn't, didn't like it, then, you know, all of my expectations about um, having any kind of oat-based meals in the future might be biased by that one, one particular instance. So really it comes down to human nature and our desire to, to form this almost this narrative around what we think is the right, is the right thing. But the reality is, is that what we say 
what, what we tell other people, what we think and what we do are not the same thing. And most of us are boring. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting uh, with the whole variety thing because we see it all the time. And we say, say to people that go for this, eat, eat, eat like this. And suddenly they're the, their food, they're the biggest foodies, gourmet uh, reviewers, etc. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah, on, and yeah. on that note of variety and, and just sort of finding what, what your nutritional repertoire is, like how does, how does like flavors and senses and different sensory emotions that come up with food play into a part of like what you deem to be satiating and fulfilling in, in your nutrition? How does that play a part? I think if you can imagine, if you can imagine foods that have like a very singular kind of sensory profile. Um, so you imagine like an ice cream or imagine you know, a bowl of oats, but with no, but with no toppings. They're the kinds of foods that actually you can probably eat a fair old whack up without necessarily thinking too too much about. So, um, and in a lot of cases, they also tend to, tend to be quite calorie dense. But the minute you start to add a bit of interest and a bit of texture, because of that contrast in mouthfeel, you, that almost tricks your body into thinking, oh, there's more here. It's more interesting. Your brain is more engaged when you're eating it. You're more conscious of it, and therefore you actually end up eating a bit a bit less. So. Um, you know, I reckon if you take that ice cream example, if you had like a, a little bit of topping on it, a bit of crunch, a bit of uh, sauce or whatever it might be, you'd probably have a smaller portion than actually if you had, you know, four scoops of vanilla, just plain vanilla. Um, just again, because of that contrast between the textures um, and the flavors gives your, gives your set, you know, gives your, gives your mouthfeel just something extra to go for. That's why people always have room for dessert, as an example. That's, yeah, 100%. That's exactly why people always have room for dessert because it's just that change in um, it's that change in sensory profile that you that you have that's that your body is craving, so even though you, you you might already be satiated and think you're full. How do you think? Uh, you know, we obviously have a global obesity crisis. We have an issue around food and the accessibility around food, accessibility around fast food. How do you, what do you think needs to be done to shift the the behavior patterns of humans when it comes to to their relationship with food because you talk uh, in, in an outside conversation you mentioned like a reversion to the mean and, and different, yeah. different the way you approach status quo tell us more about this well there's a few things there so um somewhere along the lines it's become normalized for um us to eat highly processed food and a lot of it um you know somewhere along the lines it's become normal to have uh, chocolate bars and desserts uh, to um, have extra things added to our breakfast cereal, <laughs> you know. And it's 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 funny that we it's funny that we, we take that as but well, at least in developed worlds we take that as kind of like that's that's the normality. And I think there's probably a few things. So first of all, in in a lot of part a lot of parts of the world in developed worlds, so you know countries like UK, US. Um, actually, in some places, it's harder to get uh, fresh fruits, vegetables than it is to get uh, processed food. They're called food deserts, um, and uh, you know they 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 exist. And typically, you know you can find them in certain parts of um, even in London. So if you go to somewhere like a Canary Wharf, you know, for example, I, I reckon you probably couldn't find a green versus in Canary Wharf. Um, so it's a, a, a physical availability that I was talking about before is often not not there so it's really hard for people to access the second is education and people not really realizing um, what they are actually eating particularly in terms of calorie density and just how calorie dense some of these foods actually actually are and then i think there's a third bit about um, culture i mean food's always been such a close part of um, culture no matter what your background um, and i think that that's something which <laughs> over time has become just even more in, important now, when you look at other countries, you know, um, uh, developing countries, for example, you know, a lot of those things don't aren't necessarily true. People eat what they've, what they've got, what they can get their hands on. They can't get their hands on highly processed foods. Um, and so, I think that there's a whole there's not one solution to solving for that, but it probably starts with education and access. You know, people's ability to understand what actually does a healthy plate look like. You know, it's probably quite different to the plate of food that you've got in front of you, and people's ability to people's ability to make and cook that food in a way that appeals to their palate and even just to go, be able to go and buy it. To your point on reversion to the mean, so this 
is a really interesting phenomenon, but it's the simple fact that human behavior left unchecked will go back to a segment. And you see it in so many different contexts. Um, it's, it's not even funny. Actually, I heard you guys talking about it on a podcast this morning, talking about muscle growth, you know? So, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, get, getting your body used to that new set point. It actually happens with um, many, many, many behaviors. So it takes time for a new behavior to, to bed in. And if you don't actively seek to bed in that new behavior, you will drift back to, to that mean. Um, it happens in nature. It happens in statistics. It happens, you know, with brands market share. Whatever the context, there is this phenomenon of reversion back to, to the mean. The, the important thing then for us is if you have reached a new, uh, reached a new set point in behavior, then you need to make active steps to, uh, to lock it in. You can't assume that once you've got there, you're going to stay there. And what got you there is going to keep you there because that's not the case. You know? So you need, to make, you need to continue to make an intervention um, to lock in that behavior. Otherwise, you will drift back to where you were before. I mean, that, that applies a lot in, um, in this context as well with body composition. That's probably why people, if they don't rebound in six months, they'll rebound in two years. Or they'll slowly go back to how they used to be unless they, they're aware and conscious about their choices and behaviors. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, ultimately, the, the brain, um, I'm not going to say that it's lazy, but the brain likes to keep things very, very simple. Right? So you might have heard of uh, two different ways of, of thinking system one and system two. So this goes back to kind of like you know, when we were sort of cavemen, you, your brain didn't really have time to think, is that thing over there a tiger or is it a cat? Is it dangerous or is it not? You know, it just thought quickly, oh, orange stripes, danger. When we instill a new habit, we're actually using the other part of our brain, system two, the more conscious, rational, slow thinking part of the brain. And the brain doesn't like to do that. It, like, it prefers to use system one. And so you have to, work harder to make sure that that habit gets locked in. It becomes part of your, almost your system one processes so that you don't have to think about it and then therefore it will stick. But that takes time because you have to develop those mechanisms. You have to develop those memory structures uh, and those processes in order for that to, to happen. A couple of follow-ups on that. The first one is with your breadth of knowledge on this area, what do you think was, if you look on reflection, what do you think was holding you back from from mastering your own body composition for so long, when you, you when you had so much awareness around a lot of the psychology and behavioral patterns around it, what do you think was holding you back in this? Yeah, so um, a lot of the biases that I talked about before came into play. So you know, one of the biases for me was social bias, right? So they say that you are the summation of the six people that you spend the most time with, and I'm spending a lot of my, you know, I was spending a lot of my time. Uh, with folks that didn't necessarily prioritize health and fitness you know so um, if i was entering one of these 10k races i was doing it on my own you know i wasn't training with anyone nobody else was that interested in doing it um and so there was always this social pressure to go out to, um, to eat out or um, to 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 binge watch something on the telly or whatever whatever it might be um and not necessarily that, that the opposite you know the desire for people to be going uh, to be active and eating well and taking care of yourself. So that was probably the, the, the first thing. From a habit forming point of view, I never got to the point uh, previously where it was, uh, where I was acting only on system one behavior, right? I it was so ingrained in me that I didn't have to, to think about it. Um, when I was losing weight, yes, I was able to lose weight, but it was only through actively tracking everything in the MyFitnessPal app and you know, measuring every single thing in, in my meal. I've held my body weight now for the last six months, um, and I, you know, I don't track any of my of my dinners because I've put into place you know rules that I don't need to think about, um, and a knowledge of those meals that enables me to to do that. But I've had to actively go out and train my brain to think like that, and I perhaps didn't realize that in the past. You know, um, I could see the weight coming off, but I wasn't necessarily unlearning the old behaviors and learning new behaviors and embedding them into that part of my brain that could then just execute them without thinking. What were some of the key uh, ones around nutrition that have allowed you to run an autopilot uh, without, without tracking? Because without tracking is something we should all strive to. It's very difficult to actually get there though. What's, what's been some of the keys here and what rules do you follow on a day to day? So um, the first is, you know, I've, I've, I've uh, faced into the fact that my breakfasts are the same. You know, I mean, I don't change what I have for breakfast. It's oats. 
And I'm okay with that. I like them. I enjoy them. You know, I have variations on the kinds of toppings I put in, but they're variations on fruits, right? You can very easily figure out that a banana has more calories in than an apple. Um, and then you make adjustments for that. But you know, by and large, my breakfast and my lunch are actually very consistent. My meals, as I said before, my dinners. So we have, um, my family and I, we have the same meals in the evening. And A, you know, we have long accepted that actually we've got a repertoire of um, some of the same meals. So it's very easy to then start to see and understand through that process of iteration and repetition what those meals, what effect those meals have on your own body composition and body weight. And the second is just having some meal hygiene rules. So one plate, you know, make sure there's a portion of protein on there, uh, majority of vegetables and carbs. Stay clear of the fatty dressings, you know? Yeah, pretty simple. Skip the mayo. And it works, <laughs> you know? Um, but you can even apply that to um, things like uh, takeaway and, and, and stuff like that. It's actually, when you start to understand these principles, you can go through a menu and very quickly pick out what are the things that you can have that are very similar to the things you have at home. You know, I, I know, for example, I can go to bananas and have chicken breast, rice and broccoli, and that's probably about 700 calories, which is what I've had in my, my dinner out, you know? Mm. But you can, you can do that. And it, and, uh, but it comes, from, it, it comes from trial and error, um, and it comes from good meal hygiene. And just really learning what those behaviors are. Yeah, so that's exactly it. Just having more conscious awareness of what you're eating and learning, learning the principles, as you've mentioned a few times. Just to circle back on the the social bias element, what do you think stopped you from saying, okay, look, all these people are eating eating crap around me. All these people are doing these things. I'm going to do this here. What what stopped you there? Um. I think there's a, there's a few things, you know, on the, on the surface of it, there, there was always a bit of, there was almost a bit of a competition, a bit of that sort of blokey competition, right? Like, oh, you're having a 400 gram steak. Oh, I'm having the 500 gram steak, you know? And it's a bit of that machismo kind of stuff that was, that was sort of going on. And when you look back at it now, I look back at it now, I think that's ridiculous. Come on, you know, you're not a bigger man than me because you can eat a bigger steak. That's ridiculous. But at the time, you know, it was um, all part of the banter and all part of the, the fun. And that, that, probably didn't, that probably didn't help. The other part of it, I think, which is probably on a, on a deeper level, is what was I using food for in that, in, that particular, in that particular moment, you know? Am I using foods to help myself in that social situation? So, you know, am I talking about the steak and the size of the steak and how that is? Because there's something holding me back in terms of that relationship with the people that are around me and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I often found that the, the situations where I would lose control of what I was eating were the situations where perhaps I was less comfortable in, or there was some stressor involved. Um, you know, I mean, for example, I remember a Christmas dinner a couple of years ago, kids were screaming and, uh, I literally wolfed down the food that was in front of me because I wanted to try and sort that out so that so other people didn't have to deal with screaming kids at the Christmas, at the Christmas table. And because that stressor was there and I, wasn't, I didn't have the right coping mechanisms to deal with that, you know, I, I probably ate significantly more food than, um, than I should have done. So um, you guys talk about mindful eating a lot. And I, I, I think it's just as simple as just, you know, taking your time over the food that's in front of you and realizing that the food is not there as a crutch to help you in that situation, right? The food is there to be eaten. Um, and actually what's going on around you um, is, is more important. If you were in a scenario now, would you be a different, would you, how are you in scenarios now? It's probably a better question. Like when you're out with the boys and uh, everyone's ordering a beer, you might have one beer. Are you going for 10 or how, how do you feel in that scenario now? So my wife tells me that I eat a lot slower now than I used to. Okay. That's the best thing. Um, so uh, uh, I still probably eat um, a little bit too fast than I should, but, um, you know, uh, historically, you know, I could, I could finish um, a plate of food in, you know, just a, a couple of minutes, whereas now, you know, I'll, I'll take the time and actually enjoy that plate of food for what it is. Um, the alcohol thing is, is, is interesting. Um, you know, there was a point where I actually gave up alcohol entirely for six, six months uh, pre PRNT. Actually, I, you know, I went to my best mate's tank do and I uh, didn't drink. And that was more because I, um, A, I wanted to see if I could do it, but actually I put myself out there in social media. I said, right, this year, you know, my health thing is I'm not going to, I'm not going to drink this year. Yeah. 
And um, uh, I think I've come a long way in terms of my relationship with alcohol. I still haven't quite fully uh, got to the bottom of my relationship with alcohol, I don't think. But, um, you know, I could, I could not have a drink or I could have a drink and that would be fine. And what I'm playing with is, do I really need it at all? What would happen if I stopped drinking? What would happen to my relationships with my friends? What would happen? Um, how would date night with my wife look like? What would we do differently? You know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but, um, you know, to answer your question, probably wouldn't have 10 pints. I'd probably have a beer and it'd be all right. Um, yeah. I, think, I think my friends would probably take the mick out me a little bit for it. Um, but uh, now I have the tools to be able to say. Okay. Yeah. So what? How have you found, like... Um, you mentioned like different coping mechanisms. What are what are your coping mechanisms now um, that are more positive and, and keep you on the straight and narrow as opposed to potentially what you would have done two, three, four, five years ago? When it comes to alcohol, just no, no, just in general. Like you know, if you're in high pressured environments, if you're feeling a lot of peer pressure, if you're feeling stressed out, if something emotional is going on, what have you found to change? How have you changed your coping mechanisms and and how do you stay aware of what's going on in your head? Um, so it's not so you don't act in a blind in a blind state. I think so. There's a few things. So there's a, I had a fairly major mental realization a while back that so you almost you almost feel like everybody else has it together and and you don't right. Everyone else has their shit together and you don't have it. Um, but actually, that's not the case. Everybody your house has their own struggles and challenges and actually learning to recognize that. So uh, well, we're all going through something was probably the first thing was giving myself the freedom to, 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 to recognize that and not feel like I had to live up this to a particular expectation that other people might, that I felt other people might have had of me because they probably had something else going on as well. Um, I think it's about understanding your own motivations um, and making a public commitment. So in all of the circumstances, all of the cases where I've had success with a, with a specific behavior or intervention, it's because I put myself out there and said, I'm doing this, you know, um, I've gone out on social media and said, I'm doing this, I've told people. And having that external accountability is something which I think is really, really um, important. And the third is I've, I've learned to grow a thick skin, you know, <laughs> and I think that that's quite underrated, but um, it's something which is, which is quite important. Um, and that might come with, with age, I don't know. Um, or it might come with experience or whatever, whatever it might be. But um, if I think back to, um, you know, 10 years ago when I started my career, for example, versus now, I'm probably seeing the same things, but now I care less whether people, <laughs> how people react to them. Um, before I was very worried about that kind of stuff. And that's probably spilled over a lot to my personal life and my attitude towards health and fitness. You know, I would worry as to whether people, whether people would judge me for having the beer or not having the beer for having the 500 gram steak or the 400 gram steak or the, the side salad or whatever, it, whatever it might be. Mm. Oh, it's my choice, my decision, my life. You can like it or you can not, but it's, it's not up to you, mate. Well, that's the mindset, isn't it? It's not taking things personally because we always make a bigger, bigger deal of it in our head versus what's actually going. Most people don't actually care. And if we just stick to our guns, you're probably going to end up in a better place for it. That's exactly it. Just to, again, I want to go back to the reversion to the mean. I'm very curious to know, what do you think will happen post-COVID and post-lockdown? How do you think um, our society will be? Would you think there'll be a lot of the sort of, you know, the, the quote-unquote new norms that I guess have been established in the last year? How much do you think, in, do you think we'll just slowly go back to how we used to be um, pre-COVID? I'm assuming this is a big yeah. topic of discussion at your work. Oh, for sure. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a really hard one to predict because nobody knows what... A, the post-COVID um, situation is going to be really in terms of like will the virus come back? What will be the impact on the economy? What will be the impact on working practices? So um, I think if people end up going back to the office and COVID goes away and becomes seasonal, either flu, whatever it might be, I think there's going to be a lot of behaviours which will revert back to the mean. I think there are probably a few things which people have discovered during lockdown, which might prove to be a bit more sticky. Um, so um, how people shop, um, you know, the, 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 the high street is looking very different nowadays. And I think that's, you know, that's going to be the case. Uh, some new businesses would emerge, obviously coming out of this, and who knows what form they might take. But I think that a lot of people, the increase in online shopping, for example, I think is probably here to, to, to stay. 
at the same time, you can see the pent up frustration of people, you know, looking, what do they say, June 21st is like Freedom Day or something, I don't know. You know, you can see how people are yearning to go back to some semblance of their former lives the minute they can do, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing so many people saying, oh, April 12th, pubs open up, let's, you know, let's, let's go out, let's get smashed, blah, 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 blah. So I think there are some behaviours which I think will absolutely go back to the mean because there's a pent up desire, but also, you know, um, nothing structural has changed about that, right? Mm-hmm. Where I think things might start to turn out to be different, you know, online shopping, lots of companies have expanded massively their online shopping uh, offer. It's really easy to get a slot now. Um, many businesses that wouldn't even thought about it are doing it. Um, so I think that's probably going to be more sticky. Similarly with working practices, you know, a lot of companies are now putting into place these sort of agile working uh, practices. So, you know, again, that's probably going to be more sticky in the, in the long run. So to the point that I made before, it's going to be where are people making interventions to make that behavior more sticky? And I think that's where you would see that reversion to the mean and where actually has there been no structural change in reality, in which case everything will bounce back. Yeah, I think I'm in agreement with that. I think working... Uh, the working space and, and shopping are definitely two big ones that will sort of stick. I think I can't see many people going into the office five days a week. I think that, that flexibility will definitely have to be there for, for most companies. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned you're turning 40 next year. What are your uh, long-term ambitions with your body? I know you've got these powerlifting goals. What, what sort of numbers have you got in mind? Where are you at right now? And how do you plan to, to get there? I want a thousand pound total. Okay. <laughs> Can you get me there? Um, so, um, and I don't know why. I remember when I used to wonder that. I, I, used to, I, had a, I had a dream for that once. <laughs> it, it worries me that you say you had a dream for that once, saying that you never got there, because that doesn't really put me. I need to think, what, what, what is that? So it's about thousand pounds. In, what's that in kilos? 450, right? Roughly. Right, 450, yeah. 275 plus 450 plus three. Oh, I did it. I did it. I did hit a thousand pounds. I just, said, <laughs> I just realized that I did hit a thousand pounds. I think I hit about 1060. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. There you go. That's a bit new. <laughs> there you go. So I can't help you there. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 to be honest, there's no. I don't really have any, any any real attachment to it. It's not going to change my life if I if I do it. But it's mm. a commentary in a in a benchmark of strength that I think is pretty. You know, for the average person to achieve is I think is is quite impressive. Um, and so um, it gives me something to shoot for. Um, I would love the experience of actually going to a meet and um, competing versus other people to see, you know, kind of what I can do versus what they can do, you know, the whole atmosphere, that kind of stuff. Um, I think it'd be a really interesting experience to, to do, but it's a one-off. I'm no, I have no ambition to be a competitive powerlifter. I'm going to be turning 40, and uh, I think my body would not thank me for that. Um, so it's, you know, probably just a experiment and the many experiments of things that I want to do just to see how I react and how I cope. I love the idea of competing. Um, I did an endurance racing, so why not in, why not in this? Um, but my long-term goals, you know, after, um, you know, after this investment phase, let's see, my idea is to probably go to a more sustainable lifestyle um, solution after this, this two years. The idea of the, the two-year investment now is to be pretty aggressive with it, uh, as aggressive as I, as I can go. Um, Given, given my age, and uh, then we'll see, we'll move to a more sort of sustainable lifestyle um, slash slow gains uh, piece after after that. I think that's the way to do it. I think with the powerlifting, it's one of the, like I, I was a massive powerlifting fan for, for, for a long time and used to love going to meets, watching my friends uh, attend meets. Sadly, I had a, a back injury that took me out of the game, but yeah. I still managed to compete at a few. And I think it's one of the sports, it's, it's one of my favorite sports. And I think, even if you get the opportunity to just compete once, I think I'd do it. It's a, it's a very, it's a, there's a lot of camaraderie. Uh, it's very much you versus you. And it's all about trying to just trying to beat your old number ultimately. So I think it's one of the best goals you can have as a natural athlete as well, when it comes to building muscle, because it's just that raw strength and raw progressive overload. That's it. That's it. And you, there's just so many, there's so many incredible, impressive athletes that are out there doing some amazing stuff. Um, out there, I think it's one of the because it's a it's a relative weight a relative weight sport relative strength sport. it's a strength sport yeah um, you know you, you you see people you know with 120 pounds of body weight you know um, they're lifting four times their body weight and I, I'm just looking at it thinking oh my god I'm I'm in the war that's 
uh, just an incredible achievement, even, even though you're not the biggest person in, in the world, but, um, versus, uh, uh, let's say, something like a competitive bodybuilding where, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 the top pros, are, it's just all about um, obsessive massive size and, and not a lot else. So, well, if, um, you're not, if you're natural bodybuilding, they do split it by weight classes. So Do they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I could be the middleweight. So you can't, you got middle, light, it's feather. And heavy so yeah there is that element to it but it's a whole different ball game because you just judge purely on aesthetics rather than an objective mm. number an objective form that part i think can bring yeah 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 exactly exactly um and so yeah so i'm going to give that a go we'll see how that works out um if you sign up for british powerlifting i heard you get 20 percent of the eco so there's that too fantastic so uh to finish up ricky uh tell us how's the how's the how's the physical been the vehicle for you uh, in the past 18 months? So um, I think the physical has helped me to reassess some of the priorities in my life. It's helped me to get to new levels of performance um, at work. And uh, it ended up taking me down a path that so perhaps I wouldn't have thought that I would be going down um, five years ago, you know, to a place where I have a home gym, where I'm thinking about competing in powerlifting, uh, where I have the possibility to have, uh, you know, to be in the shape, the shape for life, for shape of my life. Um, at the time when I turned 40, I think it's pretty incredible. Awesome. Thanks for sharing your story. And, uh, I think a lot of people will find the the psychology elements interesting. Have you got any further resources or ref, or, or books that may interest some of the listeners that, that could be easily digestible? Yeah, 100%. There's a whole raft of them. Um, I can share with you a list of a few titles that I think would be pretty good. What would you say the top three off the top of your head? Off the top of my head, so there's a book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, um, which I think is a really good uh, one to, to, to read. Um, so I'll send you a link to that. Um, I was going to blank for the rest. The rest are fairly technical, but um, I'll send you a list of a couple and you can link to them. Awesome. Yeah, we'll put them in the show notes. Thanks for coming on, Ricky. Really appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully your story will inspire many. No worries. Thanks a lot.